So in the first EMC for Everyone series video, I showed that even with low ESR input capacitors and a standard ferrite bead, a switching regulator could still fail conducted emissions. So what's the solution? Do we just give up and throw a big old choke or a ferrite over the cable and then include that cable in the box like so many companies seem to do nowadays? Well, you could, but I'm gonna highlight a few alternatives that you can implement on the actual board much more elegantly. Hey guys, so first off, I'm really sorry for my little hiatus from YouTube. It definitely wasn't planned. The holidays were really crazy and then had some really big family issues going on also. But hopefully all of that is behind me and I can get back to normal and somewhat of a normal upload schedule going forward. For this video, you definitely need to make sure that you've watched the very first EMC for Everyone series video and ideally also the series where I build the buck converter board. The link for both of those will be in the description. Also, like always, there'll be a supplemental video to accompany this video and it'll be available on Patreon. That video will go into more depth and it'll really cover more of the why of this topic. As a quick recap, the evaluation board is a high power switching buck regulator. It's based around the SIC45X by Viché. It's a fully configurable part over I squared C, but there's also hardware strapping pins allowing it to run without I squared C. This board is set to output five volts at a frequency of one megahertz. It can output up to 15 amps of current. To help with conducted emissions, there are seven input ceramic capacitors, three electrolytic capacitors, and a small ferrite bead. In the first EMC video, I showed that while the filtering is absolutely required to have any chance of passing compliance testing, at the real higher currents from five amps and above, the fundamental frequency would still likely fail most testing standards. The goal of this video is to explain a few different options that can nearly eliminate all of these emissions and why you might choose one approach over the other. For testing, I designed a super straightforward filter board that feeds directly into the evaluation board. It has a common mode choke, two ferrite beads, a pie filter, and some small ceramics. Throughout testing, various components and different sections on the filter board will be added and then removed so we can selectively test them. The buck converter board will have everything populated as designed except for its ferrite bead. Remember, as designed, the buck converter board would almost guaranteed fail pretty much any EM compliance standard for conducted emissions. So the goal of this filter board is to see what is actually required to make it pass. Of course, since there's going to be a wire from the filter board to the evaluation buck board, it is going to radiate, but since we only care about conducted emissions, it's not going to affect our measurements at all. And also, since the frequency of the emissions that we're dealing with are so low, anything that would be radiated from that wire wouldn't be that powerful anyway. The test setup's going to be identical to the last time I tested conducted emissions. I'm using my Rigel linear power supply. That will power the tech box listen, which then powers the filter board and then the buck converter. The output of the listen goes through a negative 10 dB attenuator, and that goes directly to the spectrum analyzer. For these tests, I finally have a proper limit set up, so it's going to relate directly back to a standard. I'm using the EN 550-22 Class B standard. It's a really common conducted emission standard, and since it's Class B, that means it's intended for residential applications, so it's a good bit stricter than Class A, which would be used for commercial or business environments. The limits that I'm using are for quasi-peak, which is a sort of rolling average, while everything I'll be testing for is just on peak, which is the highest value. So that's gonna give us an additional margin of error, which is the name of the game for pre-compliance testing. You always wanna test the worst case scenario. As usual, I'm gonna go over all the testing results first, and then after all the tests are finished, then I'll dive into the results and what they actually mean. All of these tests are gonna be conducted with a 12 volt input and an out volt, out volt, what's an out volt? An output current of eight amps at five volts. The first test is just a baseline without anything populated on the filter board. All of the series filters are just shorted across with a wire. 
it's quite obvious that there's a massive peak at the fundamental frequency, which is one megahertz. The rest of the harmonics are borderline crossing the limit, and this is exactly what we saw in the first video just going over the buck converter board. The second test adds a large common mode choke. This was mainly done just to see if there is any common mode noise. Eventually I'm going to get a second listen and I'll connect them up to where I can split the differential from the common mode noise. There was very little change in this trace except there's now actually a peak at around 210 kilohertz, which is really close to the limit. The rest of the peaks in the harmonics were lowered by a few dBUV, but nothing major. Now for the third test, I populated the ceramics before and after the common mode choke and before and after the ferrites. I also populated both ferrites. The results speak for themselves. There's absolutely no peak at the fundamental or any of the harmonics. The peak that's at 210 kilohertz, it's still there, but it's actually a little bit higher. It's right at the limit line. To make absolutely sure that the cause of that 210 kilohertz peak is the common mode choke, I went ahead and just removed it and then shorted it across. This completely removed that spike and now there are no peaks that come anywhere close to the limit. For the final test, I removed both of the ferrites and just shorted across. I then populated the Pi filter and the Pi filter is the 22 microfarad capacitor, 247 microfarad, in 2.2 microfarad ceramics, and it's also the 2.2 microhenry inductor. The trace for this setup is really similar to the prior test with the ferrites. There's just a small peak at the fundamental frequency of around 37 dBUV. So the first test with everything on the filter board completely bypassed, it let us see how the raw buck converter board performed without any series filtering. As I said in the first EMC video, a rule of thumb that I really try to follow is when using a buck converter board, if it leaves the board, you have to assume it's going to fail conducted emissions unless you have some sort of series element filter. Just having low ESR capacitance, even with an extreme amount like this board has, it isn't enough to rely on normally. And keep in mind that this is still way better than how most boards would perform when they just follow the recommendations in the data sheet. Some data sheets just say to use electrolytics and don't use any ceramics. The second test I did, even though I knew it really wouldn't help things, when you have a good layout on a buck converter board and the loops are small, common mode noise usually isn't the most common noise source. It's almost always going to be differential from the really high currents and voltage swings on each switch. What did completely catch me by surprise was that peak at 210 kilohertz. I don't really know what caused it. I have a few ideas. I'm gonna cover those in the supplemental video. What this really shows is why pre-compliance testing, no matter how limited you are and what you can do, is so important. You can't just look at a data sheet and know that a common mode choke is going to have a random resonance peak at 210 kilohertz that could cause your entire product to fail. The reason that the peaks did reduce by a few dBUV from the common mode choke is likely just due to the stray inductance that the coils has. It made it kind of act as like a weak Pi filter. This technically is a parasitic effect because an ideal or a perfect choke doesn't filter or attenuate differential currents at all. Adding the ferrites along with the ceramics made a massive improvement to the emissions. The 210 kilohertz spike was still there, but again, once the choke was removed, the results were essentially perfect. This leads to the natural question of why did this specific ferrite make such a big improvement when the one on the buck converter didn't? The answer is surprisingly simple when you look at the ZRX chart of both beads. The ferrite used on the filter board starts to show around 20 ohms of impedance at one megahertz, and then it rapidly increases as the frequency increases. The original ferrite that's on the buck converter board doesn't really start to show any impedance until around 10 megahertz. Remember, since these are series elements, the higher the impedance at a specific frequency, the more effectively it's going to block noise at that frequency. 
Since ferrites tend to filter out most of the noise as heat, the ferrites were noticeably warm during these tests. So based on the charts, it's pretty obvious why only the one model helped with the emission. So then, why is it that I didn't use the better ferrite on the buck converter board? Simple, it's like a tenth the size. Like virtually everything in filtering, the lower the frequency, the bigger the physical parts typically are. So to save space, you may not always be able to use the most ideal part. And as an aside, I know there's two ferrites on the filter board. I did do a test where I removed one of those and the results really were comparable actually with the Pi filter. There was now a peak on the fundamental frequency, but it's still not anywhere close to the limit. The final test that I did was remove and short out the ferrites and add the inductor and capacitors for the Pi filter. This setup also performed really well with only a 37 dB UV peak at the fundamental. Since both the ferrites and the Pi filter worked nearly as well as each other, when should you choose one over the other? Well, for that question, I don't really have an amazing answer. If you've followed me for a while or have been in the Discord, if you're not already, make sure to join, you know that I, I really love Pi filters. I'll typically choose them over ferrites, especially for any input initial power filtering. The ferrite that I found for the filter board is honestly kind of an anomaly. Normally, ferrites are more like the one that I used on the physical buck converter board. They don't normally become very effective until at least tens of megahertz, if not much higher. They also rapidly lose effectiveness as they become saturated with increasing current. While an inductor, as long as you don't exceed their rated current or their saturation current, you're normally okay. An inductor also won't heat up like a ferrite since they truly block the emission with its inductance. With a Pi filter, you really have the flexibility to set the cutoff frequency to whatever you want. I'm going to cover that in the supplemental video, what method I specifically use to be able to choose what inductor and capacitor values for a specific frequency. So for me and my rule of thumb is I normally will default to a Pi filter just because I honestly feel more comfortable with them. As a big reminder, you must always make sure you have enough capacitance on the downstream side of the inductor if not, you can completely deplete all of the capacitance of the decoupling capacitors, and this will make your circuit potentially not function, and it can absolutely make EMC issues much worse. I actually tried doing a test in this video to show that with the filter board, but with the massive amount of capacitance on the buck converter board itself, I wasn't able to. If this is something you would like to see me test in a future video, please let me know in the comments. So the goal of this video and the series of tests that I did was to show just how effectively you can filter conducted emissions from a buck converter. Using either a properly selected ferrite, make sure it's properly selected, or a Pi filter, you can easily reduce any emissions to where it's not even gonna come close to failing any EM standard. I also tried to highlight just how effective pre-compliance testing can be, especially for conducted emissions, and why, honestly, in this day and age, it's almost a requirement if you're doing a design that you're going to sell. In the supplemental video, I'm going to cover, like I said, how best to choose, or at least how I choose, the specific Pi filter and its values, and I'm also gonna cover some big risks that are behind using ferrites, Unfortunately, it's a lot of the ways that you oftentimes see them being used. If you liked this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and also subscribe if you haven't already. As always, I really hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next video.